Hey guys, Wilk here. So welcome to our review of the Sim Magic Alpha Direct Drive wheelbase. This is a 15 newton meter wheelbase that competes pretty much directly with the Fnatic DD1 and Simicube 2 Sport. So let's jump in today and see how it does. So let's quickly go through what we get inside the box. Now I'm not gonna do a full unboxing for you guys because you know the packaging is kind of unremarkable and I wanna try and keep this as short and sweet as I can, but I will just quickly show you the box now and you can see there's plenty of insulation there. So yeah, I mean, it's all very high quality packaging, no issues there whatsoever, but we just don't really need to go through a full unboxing, I don't think. But let's go through the accessories that we get now, starting with the power cable. Now this is the same power cable that we saw with the Sim Magic M10 in our previous reviews and it does have this little rocker switch on here which serves as an emergency switch should you wish to use it in that fashion. Now unlike with the M10 there is an emergency stop switch which you can purchase separately which plugs directly into the base in addition to our power cable too. So you do have that option should you wish to do it and that was one of the nitpicks that I had about the Sim Magic M10 previously. So I'm glad that not only do we have this switch now we also have the option of an emergency cutoff switch which we can mount on our rig directly. So that's really good. Uh, we've got our power brick here as well which is quite large. I'll flash the measurements up on the screen for you guys. Uh, it's it's not a brand name power supply like what we get with other wheelbases within the same price range. So we'll see how this performs. We'll see whether it gets hot. It looks to be completely passively cooled. I'm not going to open this guy up for you because I think it is plastic welded and uh, I don't want to break it opening it up. But it's a 120 to 240 volt switch mode power supply. So regardless of what uh, country you live in, as long as you've got the correct IEC cable or power cable, you can plug that in and it will work. There is also a power switch on here as well. So we've got multiple points of uh, power cutoff should we need it. We've got this one and obviously the power cable we looked at earlier. And it says here as well, output is 36 volts at 10 amps, just in case you're wondering about that. Now we have the same connection that we saw on the SimMagic M10 as well. It's kind of like this PS2 style looking connector there with four pins internally. So you can see one, two, three, four. So two positive and two negative, which I assume is two separate power rails coming out of the power supply. We've got a Ziploc bag here with some M6 bolts for mounting as well as an Allen key. And we'll talk about mounting in more detail in just a moment once we get onto the wheelbase itself because there are a few different mounting options available with this guy. We've got a repair card here as well. It's not an instruction manual, it's just a warranty card. Uh, if we can open that up and it's got our manufacture date and a few other little bits and pieces of detail in there as well. Then we have another bag here with two USB A to B connections in it. These are two meters long each. Now, I don't know why there's two supplied because the wheelbase itself only actually has a single USB A to B connection to the PC. So yeah, not sure what the story is with that, but we'll, if we do figure that out, we'll let you guys know later on. It may just be as a spare. But again, these are nice high quality cables. Uh, they're all shielded as well. You can see there is a little ferrite choke on there too. So that's good. And that is everything that you get inside the package. So nice and simple, nothing really there that doesn't need to be there. And yeah, as I said before, all very well packaged. So I don't imagine you would have any problems with things arriving damaged. Now we're gonna be testing today with the round leather GT one wheel as well as the GT four wheel. There are a couple of different configurations available between Alcantara and leather as well as D shape and round shape. And different resellers will also sell this base with different packages of wheels for discounted prices, depending on who you buy from as well. And we're gonna talk about distribution in just a moment because that is a really important point to cover in detail with SimMagic. But as these wheels do interface wirelessly with the base itself, it is an important part of the story too. So we will be having a look at these wheels and whether we would recommend them. Because obviously, if you're going to be buying a Sim Magic wheelbase, although you can use other wheels with it, most likely you're going to be using their own wheels. So we will have a look at those in details today too. But let's go into more detail now on the base itself. So I'm sure a lot of you have already noticed the similarities between the Alpha and the SimuCube 2 Sport and Pro. Now, unfortunately, I don't have those two models here in the studio at the moment to compare directly. But what I do have is a DD2, a SimMagic M10, and of course a VRS Direct Force Pro, which uses a small midge motor that we see in a few other direct drive wheelbases too. So just to compare the Alpha against the SimiCube 2 Sport in terms of measurements, the SimiCube 2 Sport is 130 millimeters tall and wide and 250 millimeters long. Now give or take a little bit for the size of the quick release, which will obviously depend on the quick release you're using with the SimiCube 2, about the same length as the Alpha. Width and height wise, this is 20 millimeters less at 110 millimeters tall and 
and wide. Now, I actually really do like the form factor of this. I mean, I know it does look like a bit of a copy of the Semi-Cube 2s, and there's no way around that, but I do like the fact that it's really nice and small. It kind of hides away, and it disappears behind your wheel, which is really cool. Being nice and short as well means that you can mount your monitor really closely behind it. And we also do, of course, have the connections coming out the sides as well, which means we can get the monitor even closer. Compare that with the Semi-Cube 2s. They have the connections coming out of the back, which means you do have to allow for that extra little bit of distance between the back of the unit and your screen as well. So that is a nice little design feature that I think will uh, appeal to a lot of people being able to run the cables out the sides so they don't interfere with your screen. But otherwise, very, very similar to the Sport and the Pro in terms of the design. Now comparing against the DD1 and the DD2, obviously you can see here it has a much smaller footprint. Lengthwise, it's really gonna come down again to the wheel you're using and the quick release that you're using. So it's a little bit hard to compare directly here. But overall, it's gonna end up being somewhere between about five and 10 centimeters shorter than the DD1 or DD2 once you have it mounted up. And again, with the DD1 and DD2, you do have those connections coming out of the back. So you do have to account for that as well if you're gonna be mounting your screen directly behind. So I do think that this is something that's important to consider if you are gonna be mounting your screen directly behind, you wanna have it as close to you as you possibly can, or if you're wanting to have the screen on top and wanting to have it as low as possible too. Obviously having this being so short, the distance between where your wheel is going to be sitting and where your monitor is going to be able to sit on top of it is going to be less as well. So something that's worth considering there, but otherwise very similar physical design to the Simicube 2 Sport and Pro. Now the comparison with the M10 is actually quite interesting because the motor inside this, and we showed you this when we did our review of the M10 a couple of months back, the motor inside this is actually quite a lot smaller than the Alpha is, but because of the design of this with all the passive cooling around the outside, all the heat sinking and all the electronics kind of sitting separate from the motor, the overall footprint does end up being quite quite a lot bigger with the M10 than it is with the Alpha. And overall, we end up with a distance or a depth about five centimeters longer than the Alpha as well. So let's get these other bases off the table now and have a closer look at the Alpha in detail. So let's talk about the details around the SimMagic Alpha wheelbase now. So 15 Newton meter direct drive motor in this, and it is a servo motor as well. Now, if we compare that to the 10 Newton meter motor that we have inside the M10 direct drive wheelbase, that is a hybrid stepper motor, meaning it's a stepper motor with a resolver or an encoder on the back so it can know what its position is and make adjustments in real time. So the advantage of a servo motor, which is the preferred type of motor for a direct drive wheelbase over a stepper motor, is that it's able to maintain high levels of torque at high rotational speed, whereas a stepper motor tends to lose torque at higher speed. So it's a bit of a compromise there. Now we were quite impressed with the overall performance of the M10, but I'm expecting that this will be a significant step up in the overall fidelity of the force feedback the numbers aside. So the step up from 10 to 15 Newton meters may not seem all that significant, especially when we keep on saying that you don't necessarily need high amounts of torque to really sort of feel a lot of fidelity and really get a good driving experience. The difference between the servo versus the hybrid stepper motor that we had in the M10 is I think where we're gonna feel the bulk of the difference here between the two. So I just wanted to make sure that was clear as well. Now we do have another video where we went into the differences between the types of motors used in direct drive wheelbases in a lot more detail. So I'll link that down in the description for you guys below as as well if you want to check that out and learn a little bit more. Now one of the first things that jumped out to me here is the versatility we have in terms of mounting options. So we've got our standard mounting points on the front here which are compatible with the same front mounts that we would use for a Simicube 2 or a small midge motor. So if you've got a front mount from Sim Labs or Track Racer or this is a SimCore one then that is going to be directly compatible there. We also have some mounting holes on the side here as well. We don't get any additional mounting brackets in the box with this though so if you are going to use those you'll need to come up with some sort of bracketry for yourself. And then if we flip it over on its back, And then if we flip it over onto its side so you can see the base, you can see we have four more mounting holes in the bottom here as well. So if you wanna hard mount this to a desk or to a flat wheel deck or something like that, then you do have that option too. So it's good to see that they've included an abundance of choice here and there shouldn't be any problems when it comes to mounting. These are all tapped directly into the housing of the motor assembly itself too. So there's not gonna be any issues with flex as far as I can see, but obviously we'll comment on that once we've got it all mounted up on the rig in just a minute anyway. Now, as we mentioned before, we do have the connection connections coming out of the sides of the motor too. So we've got our USB connection and our power connection. And then on this side, we've got our emergency stop and our CAN bus connection. Now I haven't seen any accessories using this CAN bus interface just yet. So we're not gonna cover that in today's video, but if we do get our hands on some accessories in the future, we'll obviously let you know about that. But I do like the fact that these connections come out of the side. Obviously that does give us, as we said before, the ability to have our screen directly behind the motor without it interfering with any of the cables. So that's a nice little touch there. And because we can run these out to the sides as well, they're not gonna 
going to get snagged on our legs or anything like that. Now, one thing I think is important to point out here as well is that power connection. It does have, and I'll just grab the connector side for you quickly as well. It does have a little clip here. So we actually have to pull back on the connection to release it. So I do like that because it means it's not going to get knocked out by accident. If we quickly plug that in for you, we can see it clicks in. And if I tug on that, that's not going to come out. I actually need to pull on the sheath there to release that. And then it comes unplugged quite easily. So that is a nice quality connector there. And we're not going to have any issues with that coming unplugged on us, which is a nice little touch. Now, if we spin it around back to the front again for you guys, you can see a little power light, which will illuminate there. And we'll look at that once we are up on the rig as well. Now the Bluetooth transceiver for connecting to our wireless wheels is actually sitting directly behind this little plate here as well. Unlike with the SimiCube 2s where it's actually in the rear. Now the original SimiCube 2s didn't have any sort of an antenna assembly built into them externally. And I actually did have a few connection issues with my SimiCube 2 Ultimate originally. Ended up replacing it with the newer model which came with an external antenna. But that was still sitting on the back and it is another thing that can become snagged or you know broken off over time if you're not careful. So I do like the fact that they've kept this antenna integrated but it is sitting at the front here so we shouldn't have any connection issues. I've never had any connection issues with the more modern SimiCube 2s that have that external antenna but we'll comment on that as well. We'll keep a close eye on that when we get up and driving see if we do have any dropouts with connection. I don't anticipate that being an issue though with the connection sitting in the front here. And then we've got the exact same quick release mechanism that we saw on the SimMagic M10 and we'll talk about that a little bit more once we've got this mounted up on the rig and I can show you how the wheels click on but you can see there four little connector pins and sort of what looks like a Wi-Fi pattern there. Only two of those are actually Actually active those are connected internally to power and that's how we supply power to our wheels so we don't have to worry about recharging batteries or batteries potentially going flat on our wireless wheels while we're driving which is another thing that I do particularly like about the SimMagic wheelbases I do really think that they've nailed it when it comes to the design of their quick release and again when we reviewed the SimMagic M10 we noticed that there was no flex in the quick release on this which actually surprised us when we compared to say the likes of the Fnatic wheelbases which do have a bit of an issue around flex in their quick release mechanism so I'm actually a big fan of the quick release that SimMagic are using on all of their wheelbases. And I do think that this is a bit of a wake up call for the industry. It is a pretty standard quick release that we actually see used in real life motorsport. And I really do like the implementation here. I was a little bit worried, again, when we did our initial M10 review about a year and a half ago now, or a year ago now, that we may see some issues around wear and tear on the PCB here. But I've been keeping a really close eye on all the forums, all the Facebook groups, and I haven't actually seen a single person complain about issues with the quick release at all. So yeah, I, I really can't complain about it. I think it's actually a really, really clever design. Now, I did promise you we'd have a quick look at the wheels as well because they are an integral part of the overall ecosystem with the SimMagic bases. So we have reviewed both of these wheels previously and I'll refer you to that down in the description below for more details. But I just wanted to quickly highlight here, we do have a nice leather wheel here and you know the quality of these wheels has actually been quite impressive. I did actually spend about three months using this wheel on my SimiCube 2 at one point. And yeah, look, I was really impressed with it overall. It can actually connect these wheels via USB Mini as well. I think there is an option available for a different style of connector as well for those who are wanting to use this specifically on a different base. But you can connect it via USB there. And overall, for the price point, I do think that these wheels offer good quality. The rotary encoders one is one thing that I've noticed they have improved over time as well. The first GT1 wheel that I had, I wasn't super impressed with the feel. Just the detents as you clicked through the different positions didn't feel super defined previously, particularly when you're wearing gloves. But this new wheel does seem to feel significantly better than the previous one did. And that was something that I commented when we reviewed this wheel a couple of months ago as well. I still do think that the shifters are a little bit subpar. Although they are magnetic shifters, they don't have any adjustability built in. And they do just feel a little bit vague when you compare them to a lot of other magnetic shifters on the market. But again, I think for the price point for these wheels, they are very, very good quality and they definitely do get the job done. And the rest of the buttons are actually really good. These guys here, with the little metal surrounds around them on the GT4 wheel as well, have a really, really nice feel to them. But again, refer to the other videos where we reviewed these wheels in more detail. And we'll talk about these a little bit more when we get up and driving as well. So I think before we move on and take a look at the internals of the wheelbase and start doing some driver testing, now is a good time to talk a little bit more about build quality in general as well as customer service. So. SimMagic, when they released the M10 originally, we could see that there were some corners that had been cut with that. I remember when we first unboxed it, we had some screws that fell out in the packaging, you know, things like that, that kind of were excusable for a wheelbase of that price point perhaps, but definitely not excusable for something that costs as much as this does. You've got to remember this is actually more expensive than a Fnatic DD1 is and about on par with a SimiCube 2 Sport. So we're expecting to see top notch, top quality, no expense spared kind of stuff here. And I've got to say, you know, so far I have 
been very impressed with what I've seen. One thing I do want to mention here though is the customer service side of things because I think this is really important. Now, the Simmagic Alpha does come with a one year manufacturer's warranty. Compare that with a DD1 that comes with a three year manufacturer warranty. The Simi Cube 2s come with a two year warranty. Now, what's a little bit different with Simmagic, which is really important to understand, is that they don't offer customer support directly to customers unless you purchase directly from them yourself. So if you're purchasing through a distributor, you are completely at the mercy of the support level that is provided by that particular distributor. So I would definitely recommend do your research and make sure you're buying one of these from somebody that you trust. They have had a lot of issues with unauthorized distributors as they call them selling these and then not having any customer support at all. And I have seen a few people that have been bitten by that. They bought one of these from the cheapest bidder and then ended up you know, in a situation where they weren't able to get any support because Sim Magic wouldn't help them either. Now Sim Magic do have a dedicated Facebook group which is run by their own staff. But I have seen some things in there that have had me a little bit concerned in the past. I've been keeping an eye on that group basically to sort of get a picture of what's been going on with the brand in general, whether there's any common issues that people have been having and things that we might want to sort of let you guys know in a review video. Uh, and also keeping an eye on the progress with the M10 as well since we reviewed that. Now I have seen a couple of things that have concerned me and I think that it's more down to the actions of one individual rather than the brand as a whole. I don't think it's necessarily indicative of the experience that you should expect to have as a SimMagic customer. But yeah, I've seen a couple of instances where comments have been deleted or review videos have been deleted when they haven't liked what the person's had to say. So while they do have the right to do whatever they want with their own Facebook group, and I mean, that's not up to me to decide how they should manage it. I do just think it's important to be aware that you know, the group is heavily moderated, so you're not necessarily gonna get an accurate picture of exactly what the customer experience is like just based off that group alone. So I would definitely do some wider research, ask in some other independent groups, ask in some of the sim racing groups that aren't managed by manufacturers themselves. I've always been really happy with the communication and the level of support that I've received from simrigs.com, so I have absolutely no problem recommending them. But yeah, just do your research and you shouldn't have any problems. But let's move on now. Let's get the back of this taken off, show you the insides and then we can get driving. So I've quickly taken out the four screws that secure the back plate here onto the motor assembly. Now, unfortunately, the cabling itself internally is quite short and there's no connector on there. It is actually soldered directly to the main board inside. So I can't really pull it apart any further. We don't own this wheelbase. So, you know, I don't want to take any risk with it and potentially break it or anything like that. So this is about as far as we can go here, but I can tell you, Looking at the PCB there, it's all wave soldered and I don't see any red flags whatsoever. So everything looks to be nice and good quality there. No, uh, no obvious problems or no obvious shortcuts that have been taken. That looks absolutely fine internally. Now, just a couple of other quick things to note while we do have this apart in terms of the hardware that's being used internally. So we talked about the quick release in a little bit of detail earlier, and I do have a separate video where we actually pulled one of these quick releases apart and showed you the internal workings and how you can actually use one of these bases. We did it with the M10 base, but obviously being the same quick release, it works exactly the same way for the Alpha 2. So you can mount other quick releases on here should you wish to do so. You can scavenge the power to use it for other purposes, all those sorts of things. So check out that video if you want to see more detail on the quick release itself. But look, internally here, we've got a 12-bit resolution encoder for the motor position. So that gives us 16,385 points of resolution or data points throughout the rotation. Now, if you compare that to the VRS Direct Force Pro and the CMUQ2 Sport or Pro, those use 22-bit encoders, which gives us 4.2 million points of resolution throughout the 360 degrees of rotation. So quite significantly high there. Whether or not that actually makes a difference in terms of the usage. We'll comment on that when we go for a drive in just a minute, but a little point there to note. Other than that, we have a 4,000 hertz refresh rate for the motor control itself, so the communication between the motor and the control device, and then a 1,000 hertz communication rate through the USB interface to the game itself. So pretty standard stuff there, nothing particularly out of the ordinary. So let's get this put together now. Let's get it up on the rig. We'll talk a little bit more about the quick release, anything we notice there in terms of flex, and then we can get to the software and driving. Okay, so we're all up and running in the sim here. Now I wanted to take you through a couple of little things around the wheel, the quick release and the base before we get into the software and go for a drive. So first thing I noticed when I sat down in the cockpit is a big bright power light that's kind of shining directly in your face. Now, admittedly, when I have this particular wheel mounted, I can't see that light because of the angle I have the base sitting at, it kind of blocks it out behind the quick release. But depending on the angle you have your wheelbase set at, this may be a bit of a problem. Now you can always just put a bit of tape over it if it bothers you, but I just wanted to call that out because I thought it was a little bit strange to have a bright power light directly in your face when you're driving. Uh, they could always move it off to the bottom or something like that. I guess it's there so that you can remember to switch the base off when you're done driving. But yeah, I would like to see that move, but anyway, not a big deal. So onto the quick release, and this is one of my favorite quick releases in sim racing, simply because it's very simple, it gets the job done, there's no flex in it, and it's just overall a really clever design. Now it's adapted across 
from the D1 spec quick release that you'll find in a lot of real life race cars. And there is footage out there of people actually mounting these wheels directly into their race car and vice versa as well. So that is possible. Now it is keyed, so it'll only go on in one direction. And you can see in the back here, we've got our little power pins. Only two of those are actually used. That's just for power going through to the base. And you can see on the front here, we've got this little Wi-Fi looking symbol. So we align that pointing to the left with the mounting screws facing straight up and down. And then we grab our wheel, and we literally just push it straight on like that. It goes on very, very easily. And then to release it, we just pull on the quick release and it pops straight off again. Now there's no need to go into software or reset anything as well. As soon as you plug the wheel in, it just starts working immediately. And it really is as simple as that. So big fan of this quick release. I really do think they've nailed it. And we can see here, as I move the wheel around, there's a little bit of flex in the wheel itself. And we've talked about that when we reviewed these wheels in another video, which I've linked down in the description for you guys. But there's a tiny, I can feel a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of play there when I really, really force it. Just a little bit of a clicking feeling, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely minimal and it's definitely not something that's gonna be a problem for you when you're driving. You can see the wheel itself is flexing long before there's any flex in the stem or the wheelbase itself and everything feels very nice and solid. So that is all good. No problems at all, nothing to complain about with the quick release. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I was a little bit concerned when we did the M10 review that we might see issues with wear and tear on those pins. But I have been keeping a close eye on this and I haven't seen a single report of anybody having issues with those pins wearing out or being bent or anything like that. So I think, yeah, overall the quick release design is really great. Now just quickly before we look at the software as well, I can tell you sitting here and spinning the wheel freely in my hands, very, very, very smooth. Every bit as smooth as the SimiCube 2 Sport Pro and Ultimate. And as I've mentioned before, those and the VRS Direct Force Pro are the only wheelbases that I've ever tested, or direct drive wheelbases at least, that do have that completely smooth rotation. The Fnatic DD1 and DD2 do have that slight notchiness. Now, admittedly, that has improved a lot in more recent firmware builds. So it's almost at the point now where it's completely negligible, but this is absolutely buttery smooth. There's not a hint of cogging at all in there, but we'll talk about all that in more detail when we go for a drive in just a minute. Let's take a look now at the software configuration side of things. Now I've jumped onto simrigs.com, which was my distributor for the base. So I'm gonna scroll down and find the download and manual software here. Click on that link and that's gonna take us through to the simmagic.com webpage. Now it's great to see that simmagic actually do have their own website now. It's been one of the complaints that the community's had for a long time is that there wasn't an official simmagic website, just distributor ones, but they do have their own site now, which is a, I guess, a centralized location where you can always find the latest drivers and firmware. So that's a big step forward for them. That's something that I was really looking forward to seeing. Now, one other thing as well I wanna mention, if we click across to download and attachments, we can see there's instruction manuals as well. And I'll just quickly go across to the instruction manual here, because this was something that did really impress me. Very, very, very detailed instruction manual. Now there are still a few little translation issues in here. It's a little bit difficult to read in a few places, but all the information is there. And you know, it's, it's very well presented. They've done a very good job. Now, one thing that I did notice here when I was scrolling through the manual is it says the built-in encoder has a resolution of 262,144 pulses per revolution. Whereas the simrigs.com spec sheet said 16,385. So that's quite a big difference there. I'm not sure which one is actually accurate. This could be a mistake in the manual. It could be a mistake on Simrig's website. I have seen this same number quoted elsewhere as well though. So I just wanted to call that out. I'm not 100% sure. It's probably not gonna make a whole lot of difference to the driving feel anyway, but I did just wanna call that out. I'm not sure which one it is. So just wanted to make that clear for you guys, but we'll continue on and you can see a whole bunch of information here, what to see in the packaging, how to mount the quick release, you know, all this stuff. So you guys can download and skim through this yourselves, but I did just want to point this out. It's got instructions for firmware updates and all the bits and pieces that you're going to need if you buy one of these. So we'll close that off now, and go back to the download page, and we're going to use the alpha software English version. So we're going to download that, and it's just an executable file that you download and run through a standard installation wizard to get the software installed. So we don't need to show you all that. You guys know how to install software by now, I would hope. So once we've run through the installation wizard, we'll now have a folder in our C drive root directory called Simmagic Alpha. We can open that up and we've got an executable for the Alpha Manager software, which is the main software we're gonna be looking at here. We also have an executable here called alphachannel.exe that allows us to choose the channel that we wanna use for the wireless communication with the wheel. We didn't have to change any of this out of the box though. I was really impressed. This is one of the things we mentioned in our M10 review previously. We had a lot of problems getting things running out of the box. I'm really happy to say in this case, everything just worked. We literally just plugged the base in, installed the software, opened it up, and everything just worked straight out of the box. So that was great. But if you do need to change the wireless communications channel for some 
some reason, you can do that from here. You can see channel 60 is selected currently, but we can drop down and we can choose from a range of different channels here. Simply select it and then close the software and we're good to go. Now we had some issues with updating the firmware on the M10 previously, and I'm sorry to say, unfortunately, this does seem a little bit clunky still. And this is one area that I would really love to see them improve. We open up this alpha wheel update online executable. And you can see it just says equipment not found straight away. Now I've been through all the troubleshooting steps, all the usual protocols. And for some reason, I just cannot get this to work. If I click on yes here and I click on start download, the button's just not enabled. If I click on check update, nothing happens there as well. Now, again, we haven't actually needed to update the firmware, so it hasn't actually been a problem, but I just think this is something that they could integrate into the main software package to tell you when there's an update available and automatically allow you to install it rather than having to open a separate executable and have to sort of clunk around with stuff like this. So, you know, it is what it is. There is a troubleshooting guide here as well that runs through, but again, we've followed all the steps here. One of the things that calls out is, uh, where is it? We keep scrolling down. Equipment not found. So it says exit the software, restart the wheel and go back to step one. We tried that obviously, and it hasn't worked. But that hasn't stopped us from being able to get up and running anyway. So not a major issue, but again, just something that I wanted to point out to you guys. But the main star of the show here is the alpha manager.exe. So we're gonna open that up now. And this is where we can make all of our fine tuning adjustments to the calibration of the wheel. So if we click on calibration here, you can see all the buttons are showing up. They highlight as we press them. Now, one thing that's important to quickly note here is this toggle switch on the left-hand side is for the calibration of the wheel itself. It's not a switch that's mappable inside your games. And again, we covered that when we reviewed these wheels in previous videos, but all the other buttons are all functional. You can see they all pop up. Shifters are showing up as well as we push the buttons. They show up in the calibration tool. We've got our rotary encoders as well. And those are also push buttons. So we can see as we push those down, they show up too. And if we quickly pop this wheel off and swap it over for my GT, one wheel which has analog axes on it as well. We'll just quickly show you this. And this is a good opportunity to show you how the interchangeability works as well. So immediately that's detected. You can see the lights all light up and that is working. So we didn't have to restart any software or anything like that. And now you can see we have an analog axis here as well for our clutch. So all really nice and clean. Now, one thing that's really cool about this particular wheel as well, we have a switch on the back here that we can toggle and that allows us to actually change the colors on the wheel too. So you can see as we push the buttons, they cycle through different colors. So we can set it up to be however we want or off as well. So we have the option for off if we don't want lights. Yeah, nice and simple. And I am a big fan of these wheels. I think they work really well. The shifters could use a little bit of improvement. They don't have a lot of adjustability and they're not the best feeling magnetic shifters that I've felt, but otherwise really, really do like these wheels. But I'll hand this one back to Tom again now. We go and pop this guy back on. There we go. And let's jump back across to, I'll show you state quickly here as well. So we can see here the firmware version, software version, there's some contact information too. Now I don't know how good they are at responding to emails that they receive from that address because as we said before, they do like people to contact their distributor rather than them directly. But over here under system state, we've got a bunch of warning lights as well. So you can see normal operation at the moment. If we were to get an overcurrent, that light would light up. But as we can see, a bunch of different triggers here for various different fail states. So we can see exactly what's gone wrong. We've even got an ass error there. So if you have a problem with your ass. <laughs> anyway, so let's go back to the steering calibration here. This is where the bulk of the magic happens. Now, one thing before we get started here, I wanted to call out, which I really like, is we've got this little question mark button here, which we can click on. And that brings up some tool tips for most of the adjustments here bar the game effects. But I'll explain that to you in just a moment as well. So it's really nice to see they've taken the time to write some explanations here. And they are quite well written as well. They are kind of heavy tech. And I think we can probably distill them a little bit for you guys as we go through this part of the video. But for the most part, it's gonna explain exactly what we need to know to get the job done. So these are the default settings that are in here by default. And I can already see, I don't know why you'd have total force, which is the wheelbase's overall strength set to 30%, which would be like, you know, five or six Newton meters. Uh, we're gonna want that probably closer to 10 or 12, I would imagine. So straight away, I'm gonna bump that up to, I think 70%, which would be about 10 Newton meters. Remembering again, we have 15 Newton meters of total force available to us. But before we get into all that, one thing I do wanna point out here is we've got a little section here for save as. 
And that allows us to save our own profile. So you can see I've actually already got one in there that I've started to set up for iRacing based off some settings that I've been looking at from other people. And I'll talk about that in just a moment too for you guys. But we can save our own INI files here for our own configurations for different cars or different sims. And because these are just basic INI files, you can also drag other people's profiles into this folder and load them yourself as well. So even though we don't have an import export button, so to speak, you can do it that way. Just drag it into the folder and you'll see it available in this little drop-down menu here. So you can see I can choose between data INI, which is just the default settings we've got loaded here, minus the 70% adjustment we just did. And then iRacing.ini sitting here as well, which is our other configuration. So we've got a write storage button, which allows us to write or commit the settings to the wheelbase, and then read, which allows us to pull the settings off the wheelbase and uh, see what we're actually working with here. Now making adjustments in here does appear to affect the wheel in real time as well. So if I crank up my friction, for example, I can straight away feel that that's gotten a lot stiffer. Crank it back down to 10 where it was, hit enter, and it goes back to how it was straight away. So it's nice that you can feel that immediate effect to what you're doing in here. It makes it a lot easier to kind of fine tune and you know get things to feel how you like. So let's just quickly go through some other settings here. I'm gonna start off with angle adjustment. Obviously we've got a centering button here as well. So we center our wheel, hit center, and we're centered, nice and simple. We've got an angle adjustment which goes between 1600. So if you're doing truck simulation or something like that, you can you know, do the roundy roundies. Now remember, because we've got a direct drive wheelbase here, there's no mechanical bump stops. So it's all software controlled. Now one thing that I have noticed, and we'll just wind this back down to 360 degrees quickly to show you guys. So 360 is what you would use for say Formula One, for example. We'll wind that down to 360. Now. When I rotate it through, you can see when I hit the bump stop, I'm getting a bit of a runaway state here where the wheels start bouncing like crazy. If we go the other way as well, you'll see the same thing too. Now, what that is, is it's the wheel reaching where it wants its soft bump stop to be or its software-based bump stop to be. And it's saying, okay, you've reached this point, go back a couple of steps to outside of that bump stop. But because I'm still applying pressure here, what it's doing is it's going back into the bump stop and it's saying reset and then it's going back in and it's getting into like a loop where it's just going bounce, 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 bounce. So it's not got the smarts to kind of go, all right, well, I know that you're at the bump stop. I can see that you're applying pressure. So kind of hold it somewhere around here. It's just going reset, 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 reset constantly. So we're probably not going to notice that when we're driving. It's, I mean, for me at least, it's quite rare that I actually hit the mechanical bump stops or sorry, the software based bump stops when I'm driving, but just something to be aware of, something that I think can definitely be improved and we noticed something similar with the M10 when we did a review of that about a year ago now as well. I'm gonna set this back to 900 again for now and hit enter. And that takes us back to 900 degrees of rotation, which is what we'd be using for the majority of GT style cars. But again, you can see when I hit that bump stop, we do get the bouncing effect. Now it's quite a nice feeling bump stop. It feels quite realistic compared to when you hit the bump stop in a real car. So they've done well there, but just a little thing that they can definitely improve I think, and again, it is important to remember that this is a software-based thing. So it's certainly not a reflection on the quality of the hardware, and it is something that I'm sure they can fix into the future. So just to note that for you guys. So let's go through these settings methodically for you now. So mechanical settings are settings that apply at a firmware level or driver level to the base itself. The game effect settings are filters that go on top of the effects coming out of the game. So almost like a preamplifier kind of thing, if you want to think of it that way. And then game force, again, is almost like a preamp that adjusts the gain level coming out of the game before it actually goes through the drivers and firmware. So everything that we're doing up here is affecting the way the wheelbase responds to those game effects and everything down under game effects and game force is actually manipulating the effects as they come out of the game themselves. Now, one thing that you will notice is some of these effects are grayed out. You can see at the moment, the only effect I have here is game damper and constant force. So what that means is basically different games output force feedback in different ways. Some use canned effects, some use physics-based effects. And depending on how that's handled by the individual sims through the direct input protocol, will determine whether or not these are available to adjust. And we've got another video, which I'll link down in the description where we went through that in a lot of detail and explained exactly how all of that works. So I'd encourage you to check that out if what I'm saying here is not making any sense to you. But I mean, this is a basic explanation of what you need to know to get up and running at least. So let's run through all these individual ones now. Total force, adjust the maximum amount of torque available to the base. Use it carefully according to your personal situation, it says here. So again, we've got this set to 70, which is about 10 Newton meters. That's generally where I end up on most of the wheelbases that I've tested. 
And then over on the other side, we've got our constant force, which is adjusting the gain level actually coming out of the game itself. So I like to leave that set to 100. I think it makes sense to make use of the full dynamic range as it comes out of the game, and then just adjust our total force depending on our personal preference up here. So I'm gonna leave that at 100 and then adjust my total force to preference over here. We then have filter frequency, which is the cutoff frequency of the interpolation filter. So we can play around with that to our liking as well. Now, I don't know exactly how that's gonna impact things just yet. So we'll obviously play around with that and let you guys know once we've found a spot that we like. We then have wheel speed, which allows us to adjust the overall speed in which the wheel can respond to movements. So this is generally, you're probably gonna to wanna to leave this set to 100, I would imagine for most cars. Maybe the exception to this might be where you're drifting if it's accelerating a little bit too quickly and being a little bit too snappy for you. But again, you can fine tune this to your own preference. I like to have a nice snappy responsive wheel that kind of responds to you know small twitches or oversteer, understeer kind of effects as quickly as possible. So I'd imagine I'm probably gonna end up leaving this at around the default setting of 100, but again, We'll talk about this later on once we've had some time to play around. So then moving on to wheel spring, this is pretty self-explanatory. This is just the springing effect or the return to center effect. So you can see at the moment with it set at zero, wherever I stop the wheel is pretty much where it sits. If we crank this up to 100%, then the wheel tries to return to center. Now, most games actually have some sort of a spring effect or return to center effect actually built into their own force feedback effects. So generally, I would imagine you're gonna leave this at zero or maybe increase it slightly if you find the game effect isn't quite strong enough for your preference. But I, I tend to find that that feels pretty artificial in most games on most wheel bases that I've tried. So I'm imagining we're probably gonna end up leaving this somewhere around zero. Wheel damper, this is just a dampening effect that gets rid of some of the robotic feeling that you might experience. Again, I would imagine we'd probably end up keeping this quite low, but we can adjust that to our preference. Wheel friction, very self-explanatory once again. At the moment, a minimal amount of resistance there at 10. If we crank it down to zero, we've just got the resistance as it comes out of the game. And again, because we do have a game running in the background, there is a little bit of resistance there. You can kind of feel the weight of the car transferring across, but we'll talk about that in a moment too. And then if I crank that friction up to 100%, the wheel becomes quite stiff. And that actually feels very, very, very smooth. Again, we'll talk about this in a moment too, but very, very smooth. That's unrealistically heavy where it is at the moment. But again, it's a combination of the force feedback in the game plus an effect being applied to the base itself on top of that. So I'm gonna crank that back down to, where did I have it? I think 10. We'll hit enter. And then we have our game damper effect, which applies a dampening filter to the effects coming out of the game. I don't actually feel any difference when I play around with this at all. So I'm just gonna leave this set at 100, which is what they're recommending in the settings here as well. But again, check out my other video for a more detailed explanation on exactly how these kinds of settings work and what they're actually doing in the background. So then down at the bottom here, we have a couple more settings for suspension, soft, normal, and hard and then response between stable and wild. So we'll have a play around with those in just a moment as well. I'm not 100% sure. I'm assuming because they're sitting under game effect, they're gonna be applying to the effects from the game and not a mechanical setting as well. But we'll play around with those in just a moment too and let you know what we find. So I think that covers pretty much everything we need to for Alpha Manager for now. Look, overall, it seems really good. I mean, all the settings that you need are there. It's well presented. One thing that I'm not seeing is a static force reduction filter. And that was one of the criticisms that I made of the VRS Direct Force Pro wheelbase as well. That's one thing that I really do love about the Fnatic wheelbases and the SimiCube 2 wheelbases in particular. But really at face value, at least, that's the only thing that I see obviously missing from here. Everything else that we need is kind of there. And it's all very well presented. It's all very approachable. It doesn't look overwhelming when you look at it. And of course, because we do have these tool tips which explain what each of these settings do. That kind of makes you feel a little bit more confident going into it as well. But let's go and do some driving now. We'll start off in iRacing, I think, which is where I'm most familiar, where I do the majority of my driving these days. We'll set a base point and then we'll test out in a bunch of other sims as well. Now, normally what I would do in this segment is take you for a drive and kind of just take you along for the ride as I'm discovering and kind of making observations in real time for the very first time. Now, I did actually record exactly that yesterday, but to be honest with you guys, I was really underwhelmed with the performance of the base. There were some aspects that I really liked. The general smoothness was good. The feeling of weight transfer, understeer and oversteer were quite good as well. But just the general texture in the road, uh, you know, feeling the difference between grass and road, asphalt, 
ripple strips, things like that were really, really lacking to the point where I couldn't even tell if I was dipping a wheel onto the grass. So I kind of figured that something must be wrong and I thought that it'd be better to spend the time to really get to know the base, talk to a bunch of other people, get involved in some of the support communities as well and just get my head around all of that stuff before sharing the experience here because I want to make sure that this is represented in the most fair way possible and I don't think that sharing a bad experience off the bat is necessarily a good and professional thing to do because some people might be skipping through the video and only watch that bit and think that I've got a bad overall impression. So I wanted to make sure that was accurate. So what I did was spend about 10 hours in total. We actually started this process yesterday and I was up most of last night talking to people. So we went back first of all to the distributor sim rigs. We got them to uh, test out with the cars and track combinations that I'm gonna be using in iRacing here for you guys as well and send me what they believe to be the best settings that they could come up with uh, as a base point. I also spoke to some other owners as well, Lawrence de Sosua, who you guys probably seen his review. Uh, he spent quite a bit of time helping me out with his settings as well, which is great. He's got a, quite a number of months of experience with this same wheelbase under his belt. So it was really great to talk to him. Uh, we got involved in the Sim Magic Owners group on Facebook as well. I put a question out there for people to send me their settings. I didn't sort of explain that I was having problems or anything because I didn't want to sort of, you know, cloud people's judgment. I just wanted to see what their settings were so I could test them out for myself. We also checked out the Sim Magic Discord community as well. And that was a really good experience. I'm actually really glad that things played out the way they did because it gave me an excuse to get involved in those communities as a normal customer and kind of see how they run and there was a lot of interaction there a lot of people sharing their settings with each other and yeah I basically spent about 10 hours just testing through everybody's settings to kind of come up with what I felt was kind of best and then fine-tune around that myself so one interesting observation was that different people had vastly different settings and I think that goes to show and cement the fact that you know, force feedback is a really subjective thing and, you know, personal preference does play a massive part in what's going to feel good to one person and bad to another person, so to speak. But in saying that, I think that there are some fundamental aspects of force feedback that are, you know, necessary and need to be present to communicate what's going on with the car well. And then you can fine tune to your preference around that. But obviously we need to have smoothness. We need to have a realistic feeling of the car's weight. We need to have a realistic feeling of the interface between the tire and the road surface. So we want to be feeling textures. We want to be feeling weight transfer of the car. We want to be feeling understeer. We want to be feeling oversteer. And we want those things to happen quickly as well so there's not any lag in the response and we're able to respond as quickly as possible. So those are all the things that I generally look for and then I fine tune around that. So what I wanted to do now is quickly show you the settings that I actually landed on in the Alpha Manager software itself. And then I'll take you through a quick calibration process in iRacing itself as well to show you how we actually landed at the best settings there as well. So I'll quickly Alt Tab out. And with Alpha Manager back up on the screen now, these are those default settings that we were looking at just before with the addition of increasing the total force from 30, which was obviously way too low, up to 70, which is about 10 Newton meters of peak force, which is about the same as what I run on the VRS Direct Force Pro that we reviewed recently, the Simicubes, the uh, DD1 and the DD2 as well. So we're trying to keep it as even playing field as possible and just kind of focus on the differences in the characteristics of the force feedback rather than the total strength. Because I think it's pretty obvious by now that 15 Newton meters of total strength is gonna be enough for the majority of people. But after, as I said, about 10 hours of fiddling around and fine tuning, what I landed on was actually pretty much exactly what the guys at SimRigs ended up sending me. So we'll click on my iRacing profile here now and write that to the storage so it's active on the wheelbase. You can see there's only a couple of little changes here on this side. Total force, we still landed at 70. We did a couple of little adjustments to the interpolation filters. Wheel speed, we ended up leaving at 100%, which is what I expected. Remembering again, we wanna have as snappy response as possible. Friction and spring, we ended up adjusting a little bit here. Wheel damper, we ended up leaving at 10. You guys can see what we've got here for yourselves. But again, this is very much a personal preference thing. This is what I felt ended up suiting my personal preference best. You can see here suspension, we ended up setting to hard and response to wild. But again, I didn't feel a massive amount of difference in changing these settings. So that's what we ended up landing on. We'll jump back into iRacing now quickly. And let's just quickly jump into our options menu here so I can run you through a couple of things. So. We're just gonna reset our force feedback settings here quickly for you so we can start from scratch. Obviously we need enabled force feedback, so the force feedback is active. Reduce force when parked, that's just a personal preference thing if you don't wanna have stiff steering when you're sitting parked. Now use linear mode, I like to have turned on for direct drive wheelbases. Again, making full use of the full amount of dynamic range that's available to us. Now if you find that road textures and things like that aren't quite defined enough for you, so ripple strips, uh, you know, dirt surfaces, tarmac surfaces, cracks in the road, then you can switch this off. But again, for a direct drive wheelbases, I tend to leave this turned on. 
Now, iRacing has an auto-tuning function built in, which is the best way, I think, to avoid clipping and get the maximum amount of dynamic range out of the game settings. So what I like to do is set my wheel force to the maximum amount of force that I have set at. So remember, we set it to 70% before, which is about 10 Newton meters. And then we're gonna use the auto-tune feature for our strength. So you can see at the moment, it's set to 12. And we can see the little auto button is disabled. So if we now close this off, we'll click done. You can see now we've got our little force feedback gauge here. So you can see that bar moves around as we move the steering. And you can see we've got our graphics adjustments here as well. Now when the auto calibration is complete, we'll see a little auto button pop up here and that will allow us to adjust our force feedback strength to allow for the maximum amount of dynamic range with minimal amount of clipping. Now we may still see a little bit of clipping which will be indicated by this gauge turning red and maxing out when we're doing things like hitting walls or bumping into other cars. But the aim here is to make use of the maximum amount of dynamic range under normal driving conditions. So bumping over ripple strips, you know, running over grass, little bits and pieces like that. We wanna get as much dynamic range there as possible. We don't really care if it starts to clip a little bit when we're bumping into walls because, you know, it doesn't really, the detail doesn't really matter in those kinds of scenarios. So what we should see here is a force feedback gauge kind of you know, bouncing around a little bit like that as we run over road textures, grass textures, ripple strips, and then we should see it bumping up as we go through corners when the cornering force is enabled. And then if we really bump over ripple strips, we'll see it bump up. And if we hit walls, we should see it going up into the red zone. So we're gonna head out on track now. We're in the Cayman GT4 today around Montreal, which is a good track to test with because it's got some really aggressive curves that you do need to bump over to uh, to go nice and fast and you, you've kind of run right out up against the grass for a couple of corners as well without ripple strips so it's really important to be able to feel when you're dipping a wheel onto the grass now admittedly this isn't the most lively car in the world but you do get a good sense of traction control kicking and you kind of have to balance the back end you can kind of feel the back end breaking away a little bit even under abs as you turn into turn one in particular as well so it's a good track to test with we will test out a couple of other cars and of course we will test out some other sims a little bit later on as well for you to give you the full picture but let's head out now i'll get my headphones on We'll run through this auto calibration. It should take about half a lap, I would imagine, before we see auto pop up on the screen. And then once that happens, we should be good to set our maximum strength automatically. So what we're gonna feel here initially is the force feedback is gonna be super strong. Or at least it might, not, it might not be that strong because force feedback is only set to 12, but then once the auto cal's finished, we'll be able to adjust that down. So let's head out here now. We're gonna keep an eye on that force feedback gauge. We will see that um, it will max out a few times probably and it does feel very stiff to me. One thing I will comment on though is that the overall feeling of the force feedback is very, very, very smooth and that was something that did impress me immediately with this wheelbase even before we got in a car and drive. And even though I said before that the you know first impression wasn't fantastic, one thing I will say, you know, and I always comment on this whenever I jump in a car, does it feel notchy? Does it feel grainy? Is there any cogging effect present just sort of sitting stationary? And you can see there on the screen, as I turn the wheels, the car is kind of lifting up on one side or the other as the wheels turn, the contact patch changes. And that is represented really well with this wheel. I can feel the wheel kind of raising up on its sides. But yeah, this wheelbase does feel every bit as smooth, I'm very happy to say, as the Simi Cube 2s do, just through turning and rotation here. There's no cogging effect present at all. So let's get driving again. Just wanted to make sure that was clear for you guys. So we are going to be on cold tyres initially as well, but we'll bump over a couple of ripple strips here. And that is a little bit too stiff for me at the moment. You can see it was just about maxing out. It feels like force feedback strength of 12 is actually not too bad, but I'm not seeing any clipping just yet. And what's important here is you can see the road texture is represented by those little tiny bounces in the force feedback. So even when I'm driving straight, I'm not putting any turning force on the wheel. You can see those little ripples and that's the road texture that should be being communicated through the wheel. Now, okay, there you go. Now you can see the auto buttons popped up. So let's just quickly come to a stop again. And if we hit that auto button, 16.2. So it actually ended up putting up a little bit. So let's just go for a little bit more of a drive again. Okay, turn. So we can see we were starting to get up into the yellow zone there. 
But we'll see how it goes when we bump over the curves in the final turn here past the Wall of Champions. Break a little early because we are still on cold tyres. Get up over the ripple. Okay, yeah, you could see it was clipping there. So I'm not super happy with that auto calibration. I might actually wind that back down to about 10, I think. I think it probably just didn't have quite enough time to adjust itself fully because we weren't really driving at full speed. I think if we'd been more aggressive, it would have probably calibrated a little bit lower. But you get the idea of how that's meant to work. We'll get turned in again here. Okay, now you can see as we go over those ripple strips, we're making full use of the force feedback. So we're getting all of that fidelity, but we're not getting any clipping. We'll just test it again through here quickly as well. Bump up over the ripple and yeah, that's fine. No clipping there going on at all. But if we do put it into a wall, you should see it will go red. There you go. So yeah, as we hit the wall, it did clip. But again, that's not important because we don't really need to feel the detail in a crash. It's more important that we're making full use of the dynamic range for normal driving. So let's reset quickly and I'll talk about the uh, overall driving impressions in iRacing a little bit more. We'll test it on dirt in just a moment as well, I think. But anyway, let's head out here and talk a little bit more about the overall driving impressions, having spent a good 10 hours fine tuning and tweaking things. So. As I kind of alluded to before, the overall sensation of the weight of the car, the transfer of the weight, the balance, and bumping over, bumping over curves, I won't say ripple strips, but bumping over curves is quite good. So very, very smooth. It's lacking a little bit of definition, I feel, compared to the DD1, the DD2, the Simicube 2s, and the Direct Force Pro. The Direct Force Pro, I felt, didn't have quite as much definition as the Simicubes in particular. But this, I feel, is about the same as the Direct Force Pro in terms of the overall, I guess, dampened feeling of the effects. So it just doesn't quite have the same level of sharpness as I enjoy with the Simicube 2s. Now, I do have experience with the, obviously, I have the Ultimate, which is my daily driver, but I do have quite a bit of experience with the Sport and Pro as well. We reviewed those in detail a couple of months back, and I spent a lot of time driving with those, so I'm very familiar with them as well. And... I struggle to tell the difference between the Ultimate and the Pro, but what I did notice was the Sport with its reduced slew rate did actually feel a little bit less snappy and a little bit less responsive than the, than the Pro and the Ultimate do. And I'm feeling the same kind of thing here as well. This just doesn't quite have the same level of responsiveness as the, as the Sport does even. So I feel like I, I haven't actually seen published anywhere what the actual slew rate is with this motor, but I feel like that's probably what the difference is. And comparing against the Direct Force Pro as well as the DD1 and DD2, I mean the DD1 is the more direct comparison at 20 Newton meters um, of torque, but at a similar price point. I think the main thing that I'm feeling this is this is definitely smoother than the DD1 is, about the same level of smoothness as we commented on in our Direct Force Pro VRS wheelbase review. But in iRacing at least, and we'll comment on the other sims in just a moment as well. What I'm finding, and I have done probably a good 50 or so laps with this base now, the definition in the fine little details, so road textures, curb textures, so like ripple strips, dipping a wheel onto the grass, it just feels a little bit robotic compared to what I was expecting out of this wheelbase. So again, overall smoothness is really good and there's nothing to complain about there at all. It's every bit as good as the Simicubes are and any other direct drive wheelbase that I've tested. So no complaints at all there. And as we bump over these ripples, I can feel that quite clearly. But for example here, if I, when I'm driving along straight, there's a little bit of road texture there. You can see the force feedback gauge is bouncing around a little bit. But it just has this underpinning robotic feeling to it. It feels not it's, it's funny because the, the wheel itself doesn't feel notchy. Like when I'm rotating it normally, it doesn't feel notchy at all. But the, the texture effects do feel a little bit robotic and a little bit notchy. And what I find is if I, if I dampen those down, if I use the settings to adjust those, to adjust that robotic feeling out, then overall it just feels too smooth and too, you know, too dampened in general. I lose the fidelity. But to bring that fidelity back again, I, I you know, I, I find that robotic detail, which is just, you know, compared to the Simicube in particular, Simicube 2s, I should say, 
just doesn't feel as nice in iRacing at least. So we'll talk about the other ones in a moment too, but let me just go through, I'll do a slightly quicker lap here for you guys. I'll just concentrate on what I'm doing. Hit all my normal braking markers. So I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling all the things that I need to feel to drive quickly, but I think the exception to that is, you know, I'm not getting a clear sense of when I'm running up on ripple strips and just there, like, I mean, for example, when the back end stepped out, I could catch that just fine. Like there was enough response time there that I could catch that slide and it wasn't a problem. But for example here, like when I run across the grass, just onto that little bit of tarmac there as I extend the track, I didn't feel the I didn't feel the texture of the grass, so I wasn't really sure if my wheel was on the grass or not. And obviously, if you touch the brakes at that braking point, as your wheel's just skimming the grass, it's going to spin. It's going to spin you almost immediately. So, I'll give you another example. I'll just come around here, just before we do a hot lap. So I felt a little bit of ripple there on the ripple strip, but tipping a wheel on the grass there, I really I can I can sense the understeer effect. So I can feel that the front of the car is getting away from me, but it doesn't feel like driving across grass. It just feels like a bit of a, it almost feels like a vibration motor inside the wheel. Which just, again, like, I mean, it's, it, it's a software thing. So I'm sure it's something that they can fine tune in the software later on. I don't think that it's a reflection on the quality of the hardware, but it's just lacking that definition. So let's try and do a quick lap now. So we'll get the back end to kind of step out on us a little bit there. Get it turned in nice and tight. Back on the gas as early as we can. Now my normal lap times around here are about high 44. Oh, a bit of a cut there, that's all right, we'll keep going. A high 44, low 45 is my average lap around here. So we'll see what we can get. So you can see there I'm making little micro corrections as we start to push into traction control there and that's all absolutely fine. This is the part I was talking about where we cut across the grass just a touch. And you have to be so careful there. If you just touch that grass while you're on the brakes, the car just spins almost instantly. So there's little areas like that, which is I feel need to be improved, at least for iRacing. So we'll finish off this lap and then I'll jump into some rally cross and we can talk a little bit more about the texture because I think that's probably going to be a more, I guess, extreme test of what we're talking about here. So there we go, that was a 44.9. So, I mean, that's that's on par with my lap times that I do with my Simicube 2 Ultimate. So, you know, as I was saying, the, I guess the, the, the raw pace is definitely there. I'm feeling all the things I need to in terms of how the car communicates what it's doing back to me, but I feel like consistency could potentially suffer just because of those little details, you know, dipping a wheel onto the grass, for example. If you miss that effect, that could cost you the race. And, uh, you know, that's definitely not something we wanna have happening. So hopefully that's something that they can fix up in software. But as I was saying, you know, you can bring in that detail a little bit more than what I have it here now, but that comes at the cost of having an overall kind of robotic feeling in those textures. And again, it is just the textures. So it's the road texture, the grass texture, ripple strips, things like that. It's not the feeling of the suspension. It's not the feeling of weight transfer or traction loss, anything like that. Those are all really, really good. It's just that road texture feeling that is lacking a little bit in iRacing. So let's jump into dirt now, see if it's any better there. And then we'll jump into some other Sims and test those out as well. All right, Sonoma Rallycross in the Fiesta now. So one little thing I wanted to show you guys, and what I did again was get in touch with the guys at SimRigs, the distributor who sent me this, and ask them for what they would recommend as their best Rallycross settings, just as a base point so I could fine tune around there, because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing something completely you know, crazy that nobody else would do just for my own personal preference. So one thing I will mention here again, we talked about the road texture issue before. 
Cranking up the minimum force a little bit does help with that as well. So it brings out a little bit more of that texture. And as we were mentioning before as well, it does come at the cost of a bit of a robotic feel. But if you're finding that you're just not feeling the things you need to feel to go quickly, then you can crank this up. I found around about maybe 10 up to 15% was about the maximum. Anything over than that, and it just starts to feel, you know, like a robot basically. But what I'm going to do for Rallycross, I'm going to set this to about 11 which uh, I know people are going to joke about cranking it up to 11, but that's what seems to feel good to me. Everything else we're going to leave exactly the same as we did before. Again, wheel force at about 10 Newton meters was more than enough strength for me and my little tiny arms. But again, 15 Newton meters I think is going to be fine for the majority of people. So if you're worried about the wheelbase not being strong enough for you, honestly, unless you're Dwayne Johnson, forget about it. It is strong enough for you. So we'll hit done on that. But let's drive out here. And what I wanted to pay attention to is just the road texture. So I'm not going to drive super fast to begin with. Not that I'd be capable of driving super fast anyway, but again, I'm just I'm just not getting a strong sense of road texture. It is a lot better than it was yesterday when I was testing, but the transition there, for example, between the road and the dirt, and again here between dirt and road, just not a massive amount going on there. Now, we can see with our force feedback gauge there that there's not a whole lot of texture being transmitted to begin with, most of what you're seeing there is the cornering force, but you know when we're going straight, you can see there's a little bit of stuff going on, so we should be feeling that. There's not a huge amount of dynamic range there. But again, comparing the exact same scenario to the Simicube, we feel a lot more definition. We feel real fine texture. The VRS Direct Force Pro was lacking a little bit compared, and we talked about that in that review. But yeah, compared to the Fnatic and the Simi Cubes, I'm just not getting that same level of definition in the feedback, even on the dirt here. I should be feeling that graininess in the texture, not to be confused with you know a grainy wheel feel, but we should feel the grain of the you know the sand underneath the wheels and all that. And it's just it just feels kind of floaty on the dirt. I'd say it's more of a problem for dirt than it is for road because road you can kind of get away with other than those little subtle instances where you might dip a wheel onto the dirt or something like that but it's really kind of taking away from the immersiveness overall because I'm just not getting that sense of driving on dirt but anyway I think that probably covers it in enough detail you guys get the point I think again this is something that can be improved with um you know with software i don't think that it's a problem with the wheelbase itself i'd say it's a software thing okay so let's give assetto corsa competition a try here so i've just used exactly the same settings as i was using for the vrs direct force pro which was the last time that i actually drove this sim so one thing i've noticed straight away there you can see the steering is crooked so <laughs> we actually had this problem with the sim magic m10 as well now if i go back and have a look in the um in the sim magic calibration tool it's not that the wheel calibrations out for some reason certain sims don't seem to center themselves correctly you can see now when i've come to a stop it's actually corrected itself but when i drive off go back into first gear here as i take off the wheel goes off center again so what we actually need to do and i don't know if there's a way around this but what we actually need to do is calibrate the wheel off the same amount to the left and then when we come in the sim it comes straight so i'll quickly fix that calibration now but yeah, not, not a problem in iRacing, not a problem in some other sims either. We'll let you know which ones we run into this issue with. But ACC, for some reason, yeah, we need to recalibrate our center off to the left a little bit. So just these little niggles with the software. Again, it's, it's down to the software, not the hardware. But, you know, these are the things that I think are important to point out because that's going to be frustrating every time you change sims. You've got to go and kind of keep calibrating it over and over until you actually get the center correct because it's not as simple as just calibrating the center correctly in front of you. So we have another look. Okay, so it's about that far off to the right, so we need to go the same distance off to the left and then calibrate it and that should come good. All right, so we've got that little calibration issue sorted now. So let's have a bit more of a look at how this performs. So immediately I'm feeling those little textures that I felt were missing in iRacing, which surprises me because usually it's the other way around. Usually I find that iRacing is the title that just works. So I'm just gonna dip a wheel onto the grass here quickly and immediately, as soon as I do that, I can feel the texture change. So I'm immediately aware that I've done something that I shouldn't have. And running up on the ripple there as well, I could feel that quite comfortably through the wheel. And the fine detail is there. It doesn't feel robotic like it did in iRacing. So I'd say as an initial impression, this feels very similar to 
what it does with the SimiCube 2 uh, Sport, I would say. It doesn't quite have that snappiness and that responsiveness of the Pro and the Ultimate, and I think that's just down to the slew rate not being as fast again. But yeah, it's, it's nice and smooth. I'd say it's probably... I mean, the, the difference between the SimiCube 2 Sport and VRS Direct Force Pro aren't huge in, in ACC, and I'd say this probably fits in about the same. So, nothing really remarkably different in any, in any sense. I'm feeling all the things I need to feel again, and I mean, I'm not the world's best GT3 driver, and I'm not the most experienced driver in ACC either, which is why I kind of, you know, do the bulk of the review in iRacing, but I do think it's important to try and cover all bases as much as I possibly can for you guys and give you, you know, the raw impressions, but I'm feeling that road texture, so I can I can kind of get a sense of what the car is doing. It's more immersive, but I also feel like I'm in more control. I feel more connected to the car. And I get the sense, you know, the, the weight transfer is good as well. This car is a lot firmer than the previous cars we drove. So you don't quite get quite that, you know, that massive sense of movement like we did in those cars, but Yeah, I mean, all the textures feel really good, and I feel like the things that were missing in iRacing are definitely here in ACC. And most importantly, I think it kind of just worked out of the box, and it's giving me a consistent experience with the other bases that I've tried in ACC as well. I mean, one of the things I think is really important to call out in these types of reviews is the consistency between different sims. And we've talked about that in every wheelbase review that I've done, because Fnatic, as far as I'm concerned, still seems to have the upper hand when it comes to consistency. And I mean, that's really important for people that want to be able to jump out of one sim and into another and still be fast and not have to go through learning curve. And I mean, you can see my, my pace here is way off just because I'm not used to driving this car and it feels so different, or this sim I should say, and it feels so different to iRacing where I'm used to driving. Whereas when I drive with the DD1 and the DD2, I can jump in and out of pretty much any sim with maybe the exception of race room and you know, it feels pretty consistent across them. So if that's something that's important to you, you know, I would still definitely consider that. But no, I'd say this this feels very, very close to the Direct Force Pro and the DD1 in terms of the quality of the feedback and the SimiCube 2 Sport. The only maybe area where it, it feels advantageous over those is the DD1 feels a little bit more grainy by comparison to this. This is really nice and smooth, every bit as smooth as the SimiCube and the VRS. So. Let's move on to the next sim. All right, Assetto Corsa, let's get out of here. So we're driving in a McLaren P1. Initial impression again, very, very smooth. Now I have spent quite a bit of time driving around in this as well, just getting things fine tuned and adjusted because we did have a few of the same issues that we had with iRacing out of the box. But I'm happy to say we got we got it to a pretty good place. I still feel like the curbs are lacking a little bit of texture here. The road surface feels pretty good overall. And I mean, you can see the car feels very responsive, very snappy, very similar in the end to where we ended up with iRacing. But just when I run over the ripple strips, I'm not feeling a whole lot of texture there, if any really at all. And you know, different tracks have different types of curves, but Nordschleife it does have pretty aggressive curves. So you would expect to really sort of feel them heavily. And you know, indeed when I drive with my other wheelbases, I do feel them a lot more aggressively with similar settings to what I have here. So again, it seems to be certain sims and the way they translate some of the texture information just isn't being filtered as accurately with the Sim, Sim Magic Alpha, I should say. Got my words mixed up there not translating quite as accurately with the SimMagic Alpha as they do, particularly with the SimiCube bases. I feel like that's really where the textures are a lot sharper and not grainy, but you really feel that grain and texture inside the surface. And again, you can see the wheel kind of is moving around. It's oscillating a little bit there, but when I have my hands on the wheel, it's hard to sort of picture it in the footage, but I can feel the road texture quite comfortably. It's, there's no problems there. But we'll dip a wheel onto the grass quickly up here. And yeah, there's just really not a whole lot of difference between the grass and the road, unfortunately. So 
I don't think we need to spend a whole lot of time here. Pretty much the same kind of impression. A little bit better than iRacing in terms of the asphalt texture, but definitely still lacking a bit in terms of overall texture and fidelity compared to the other direct drive wheelbases that we've tested around the same price point. So let's move on to Automobilista 2. All right, so Porsche 962C in Automobilista 2. Same car and track combination that we did the other day, which I really enjoyed. So I figured I'd do it while it's still fresh in my mind and I can remember exactly how it felt with my Simi Q2 Ultimate. Now, this is a very high powered rear wheel drive, as you can see, snaking around on me there. So we don't really get the benefit of the downforce, obviously, until we're going nice and fast. So we get a good opportunity to sort of snake things around here and really get a feel for the car. So I can tell you straight away, this feels really good. Once again, it's similar kind of experience to ACC in terms of just jump in and drive and everything feels good. I'm using exactly the same settings as I was in ACC too. I don't really feel the need to change anything, which is really good because obviously, again, we talk about that consistency between different sim titles and wanting to just sort of be able to jump in and drive. But the things that are jumping out at me immediately are I'm feeling the road textures that I want to feel once again, which is great. We'll go across the ripple strip a little bit here. That feels really good too. You can feel the back end kind of snapping on me there. I've got a car on my inside, so I've got to be careful. Get clear of him there. We'll put a wheel up on the grass again to feel that. Yep, feels really good. And I can feel that slide. I can correct for it straight away. Maybe the, the slew rate's down a little bit as we know with the compared to the Ultimate and the Pro, but feels very similar to the Sport once again. No major differences at all to speak of. I'd say, you know, in a blind test, I probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the VRS this and a Simi Cube 2 Sport in AMS 2, just based off this experience. I think the, the DD1 still has that kind of underlying slight notchiness to it, the um, cogging effect that we've talked about. So I would say this would probably be my preference over the DD1 for this particular game, but this is the first game where I would say that's probably the case. Maybe, maybe ACC as well, but everything else so far, I think I'd probably still pick the the Fnatic base, just purely based off force feedback. We're not talking about ecosystem or any of the other features or anything here, just based off force feedback quality alone. But let's get some tail slide action happening again through here. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is taking me to another place in terms of immersion, just as much as I experienced with the Simi Cube 2 Ultimate when I did this exact same scenario a couple of days ago. So. Yeah, I'm really happy with it. I really, I can't feel anything to complain about at all in AMS2. Yeah, a little bit more muted in terms of force feedback than iRacing and ACC are, but I mean, that's just a characteristic of the game, I think. It's kind of the same experience everywhere rather than being a complaint about the wheelbase. So let's move on to the next one. So a quick test in F1 2020 as well. I'm just gonna potter around here really slowly just to sort of feel the textures and I can feel the road texture pretty much the same as it feels honestly with every other direct drive wheelbase that I've tested. The detail and the force feedback in this game isn't fantastic anyway. So I don't really feel like it's ever gonna be a true test or comparison between different bases. But if I run off onto the grass here, I can feel the texture there. So I can definitely feel the difference between. We'll go around turn one here as well. And just run it up on the ripple strips. I can feel that perfectly fine. So, you know, I'm feeling all the things that I need to feel get DRS going there as well. The road texture feels good. And I didn't have to make any major fine tuning adjustments to get things working. My pedal calibration is way out. You can see as I hit the gravel, it's bouncing around well. We'll go over the little sausage curbs here as well and you can see that's rippling well. And yeah, I mean, it just feels every bit as good as it does with any other direct drive wheelbase really. So let's move on to Dirt Rally 2. All right, so last up Dirt Rally. Now we did have to do a little bit of configuration here just to get the force feedback working at all, which we expected, and that was part of the instructions. It's very easy, it took me probably less than two minutes to get it sorted out, so not a problem. You just drag an XML file, and I'll put a link down in the description for all those in instructions as well for you guys. But look, I mean, overall quite similar feeling to iRacing here. The, the definition in the road texture is there. I mean, you can feel again the things that you need to feel. Like I can feel when I run off onto the grass, 
and there's definitely some texture in the dirt, but it's just a little bit vague, a little bit robotic, and I found that if I cranked things up to really kind of try to bring that detail out a little bit more, it just tended to feel a little bit robotic compared to the SimiCube. I think, again, probably more similar to the VRS Direct Force Pro once we got that working. We had to do a similar hack to get that wheelbase working in this game as well. So, just to make that clear for you guys too. But, yeah, I'd say a similar amount of definition, a similar amount of detail. And we have, I have spent quite a bit of time fiddling around with the settings here as well to try and maximize it. But definitely a little bit behind what I would say from the SimiCube 2s as well as the Fnatic DD1 and DD2 for Dirt Rally. So, overall again though, you can feel all the things you need to feel to drive as I completely wipe myself out. But I think that's probably a good point to stop and get into our conclusions. All right, so conclusions on the SimMagic Alpha wheelbase. So Tom's had a decent drive as well in a couple of different titles have, to yes. uh, kind of get his opinion as well. He's yep. used to driving with a DD1, whereas I'm used to driving with the SimiCube 2 Ultimate as my daily driver. So we thought it'd be good to kind of get a mix of opinions in here for you guys as well. So what did you think from your driving? Yeah, I mean, overall, it, I've had a great experience driving with it. Yeah. It's been good fun. Um, it's had a lot of pros going for it. It's got that really nice, uh, sweet smoothness about yeah. it, similar to what we had with the VRS. Yeah, it's definitely, I'd say, one of the outstanding features is just the overall smoothness yeah. and refinement in the driving yep. experience, And definitely sure. coming from the DD1, that is a real bonus. Yeah. That's something yeah. I do really like. Yeah, so this, the DD1 and the DD2 that I've spent most of my time driving with, um, out of the Fnatic range at least, they do have kind of an underpinning graininess to them that yep. you, you tend to not notice so much when you've been driving for a while, but if you pay attention to it, it's always no, there. No, I mean, I didn't so, really know that it existed until I started trying these other ones. I'm like, okay. Okay, I can okay. feel the difference. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. But it is there, and it it's is, important yeah. to acknowledge yep. that. But what did you think about details? Yeah, there was definitely something missing yeah. when I compared okay. it to my DD1. Did a fair bit of time in the Skip Barber on um, iRacing and definitely over curbs and something. Some in a car where you would expect to feel a lot on the curbs, yeah. Yeah. I just wasn't getting it. Um, yeah. And then over grass and that kind of thing, there was something missing. After we spent a fair bit of time tweaking it, we, we yeah. managed to get something out of it and it was okay. And yeah. it wasn't detrimental But it always to... kind of felt like it was, for me at least, it always felt like it was kind of a compromise. That's so yeah. if you dialed those track effects and remember we are talking about track effects specifically here we're yep. not talking about suspension movement or mm. weight transfer or anything because all of those things were really good i really thought good, yeah. yeah like up there with the best absolutely but when it came to those finer details it was a trade-off between winding those details up and having a kind of notchy robotic yep. feeling in those details not a notchy yep. feeling overall no. but notchy robotic feeling details yep. but if you dampen those details down then you're not feeling enough of them. Yep. So yeah, find... and I think for me, it wasn't something that was making me less of a quality driver or anything like yeah. that. It wasn't ruining my laps or anything yeah. like that, but it was less immersive. Yeah. It okay. wasn't as, as cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay. So, and we're comparing that to, I think, probably, I mean, the wheelbases, and we've got a bit of a cheat sheet here with some pricing. Now, this is Australian pricing that we're looking at here. Obviously, there, there are lots of different distributors around the world, and we talked a little bit about that before, how it's important to make sure you're getting one from a authorized distributor that you trust, because the customer service experience, you know, it is completely reliant on who you buy it from, basically. So, I mean, having said that, there is good support through the Facebook group and the SimMagic community on yeah. Discord as well, but we do have to remember that they are managed by the companies, and I have seen instances where posts that they didn't like have been removed yeah, right. from the Facebook group. I haven't seen much in the Discord, but, yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't been in the Discord group long enough to notice it, but I've been monitoring yeah. the Facebook one for over a year now, mm -hmm. and um, I've seen a few instances where things have been deleted that they didn't yeah, like. So, so you really do want to choose your distributor wisely. Exactly, yeah. You need yeah. to be very careful of that if you're yeah. buying one of these. And the pricing does vary quite a bit as well. But I mean, we need to put it in perspective here. And I mean, really the, the bases that we're comparing to here are, obviously there's the SimMagic M10, which comes in at 1300 Australian dollars. And we are going to be talking Australian dollars throughout here, uh, just so we can avoid the confusion around taxes and things yeah, like yeah. that, if yeah. we keep it all the same. Yeah, the Again, same, yeah. do your own research, guys, because prices will vary depending on where you are and you need to account for import taxes and duties and all those things as well. So SimMagic M10, uh, 1299 or we'll say 1300 Australian dollars. This is way, 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 way smoother than the M10 is. No. Uh, you never drove with the no, M10, did you? No. Yeah. No. So. Yeah, casting my mind back to that one, uh, and I did have another driver one just a couple of months ago now when we did the revised review. 
that is quite grainy all yeah, the time. Okay. So the details are good. The fidelity is good. It's not as strong as this. I never found the strength with the M10 at 10 Newton meters to be too weak for me, really. It was yeah. about right at its yeah. maximum setting. But people that are stronger than me like you would probably <laughs> want a little bit more out of the M10. Yeah. So the M10 is a base that I could see you kind of outgrowing and potentially wanting to upgrade yeah, okay. from down the track. Yeah. Whereas this is something that I think you would probably commit to and probably not feel the need to upgrade again unless there was some big advancement in technology, yeah, right. like some new force feedback technology or you know something like that, some yep. really compelling reason yep. to upgrade again from this. So I would definitely say if you have the money and you're kind of going, is it worth the extra over the Simagic M10? This is 2000 Australian dollars, 15 Newton meters. M10 is 1300 Australian dollars at um, 10 Newton meters. Whether or not it's worth the extra money, it is quite a lot of extra money, but the build quality is significantly higher. Um, you know, and the quality of the force feedback overall is significantly higher as well. So I would say if you have the money, then yes, this is the better buy out of the M10 and the and the Alpha, simply because of the fact that you're probably not going to want to upgrade it again. Yeah. But it sounds so, like you're going to have a lot of fun with an M10. Absolutely, yeah. It, there's nothing yeah. wrong fundamentally with an M10 yeah. either. It's just this is better. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if you can afford Fair it, enough. then I would say go yeah. for it rather than taking the baby step and yeah, okay. probably wanting to upgrade down the okay. track. But then we also have to consider what else we can get for the price. Mm. And I think this is where it starts to get a little bit more, you know, difficult to judge because we did have some problems. I mean, we had issues with firmware upgrades not working, same problems that we had with the M10 there. Um, we had issues with the steering alignment being off and having to over calibrate it to get it to sit straight. So it wasn't even a matter of just kind of going in, setting it straight and then hitting go. It was having to adjust it and then going back into the game to see if it was actually yeah, straight right. in the game. And it was different between different Every games game as well. Was, yeah. yeah, so <laughs> I think I think Dirt Rally and iRacing were the only ones where it was actually straight. Oh, okay. Every other title that we tested, we had to tweak it yeah, to make it right. Yeah. So again, if you're changing between sims all the time, that is going to be frustrating. It's not a major issue, but it's something that you, you can need. save your preset for each game. And you can save a preset, game, but you know it is. Work. It's still work, yeah. and it's still something. You're like, oh, I've got to yeah. do this again. For yeah. for someone like me, I'm a much more casual gamer than 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 you are. Yeah, that's a real detractor. A frustrating, for me. Yeah, 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 frustrating thing. So again, when you when you look at it, and you know, little things like that that I don't think should be a problem for the money now. You know, admittedly, that's not a hardware issue. That is all software yeah. stuff. Now I think about it, every single negative point that I've had about this really comes down to the software integration mm. and, you know, the filters and things like that. I think that the hardware itself is actually re very good. Yep. Um, I didn't really have any issues with the hardware at all. I think, this is, I think the quick release is fantastic. I think mm. it's one of the best ones on the market. Mm -hmm. um, it just works and it works well. Mm. Um, you know, there hasn't been any hints really of any problems with it over the year that I've been monitoring the brand. Mm -hmm. So, I, yeah, I don't see any reason not to say it's a great quick release. Yeah. And another thing to mention is with the quick release, you're not getting the same flex that you do in the DD. That is that is well. a very good point, actually. Yeah, yeah. and I'd, I'd actually forgotten about that. But yes, the, the DD, and I mean, some people say that they don't have any flex with them. True. My personal experience, I've had two DD2s now and your DD1. And, you know, I've seen plenty of other reviews and it seems more common than not that people do have that bit of flex yeah. in, the, uh, in the stem between the wheel and the quick release or the stem on the wheelbase. And yep. that is not a problem at no, all not with at this. All. And again, that's something that's gonna really annoy some people having yeah. it flex and other people's, no, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't really notice it when I'm driving either, but yeah. you can't deny the fact that this, this is a better- nothing. This, yeah. this is a better quick release yeah, than the Fnatic yeah. one is. It's yep. as simple as that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, I did notice the base got quite warm compared to anything else that I've ever tested, even yeah. running it at sort of 70% load. Yeah, okay. Not, not hot, problematically not warm. problematically yeah. warm, no, but I did notice it got a little bit yeah. warmer, so there's that, just yeah. to note. But when you start to really compare it to what else we have on the market at a similar price point, so here in Australia at least, we have the VRS Direct Force Pro, which we reviewed a couple of weeks ago, and that is 1500 Australian dollars, around around the 1500 Australian dollar mark landed uh, with, all the, with all the associated costs that we have in Australia. Now, and again, of course, that price is gonna vary depending on where you are in the world, but that is, you know, 25% cheaper than this is. And I'd say comparing this against the DD1, which is close price point wise, and the SimuCube 2 Sport, which is a little bit more expensive, but relatively close as well. This is closer to the VRS Direct Force Pro in terms of its force feedback quality yeah. than, the, than the other ones are, but it's 25% more expensive. So it's like, well, yeah. where's the value in this over the Direct Force Pro? I don't really see it. I mean, you do have the quick release, whereas with the Direct Force Pro, you will have to buy a quick release on top of that. Uh, you do have the good quality Simagic wheels as well, which you yeah. can choose from. And they are good wheels, but they are quite expensive They're now cheap, as well. No. No, we just had a look at that before and 
as a bundle, at least again here in Australia, as a bundle to buy the Alpha, which is $2,000 with the GT one wheel, which is this one, it's 2,500. So this is basically $500 on top. Uh, with the GT four, it's 28. Hundred dollars, so okay. you know, and it is a really solid feel. It's a nice yeah, solid it's very nice. thing, but I mean, the the analog shifters on the back, the analog paddles on the back aren't fantastic. They do have that little squeak. Yeah, they got a squeak, and you can, you know, they just and we have reviewed these wheels previously, yeah, so check loud. out those videos. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that's that's normal for magnetic <laughs> yeah, shifters, yeah. so I don't think that's really a, a negative. I, I think these must be particularly loud ones. I don't think they are. Personally. Not compared to, I mean, the Asher Racing wheel is way louder than that is. is. Yeah. So, okay. I mean, it's metal on metal contact, but yeah, yeah. yeah they are okay. loud. I mean, I guess the closest things here are if we take a DD1, which is $1,900, and then pair it with a BMW GT2 wheel, which is about the same kind of quality wise as yeah. this. Maybe this is slightly nicer, but not a whole lot in it. Um, that would come out at $2,400 Australian, so $100 cheaper. Not a big difference. Than this with that, yep. And then say, for example, if you wanted a formula wheel, so we took the uh, DD1 and paired it with a formula V2, that would be about $2,500 as well. So the same price as this paired with this, but $2,800 paired with this guy. Yeah. But then you also have to factor in that that doesn't have analog paddles. So you want to add on the advanced yeah. paddle module on top of that, which is another- But then you can also look at the McLaren GT3 as well, He's, which I mean, is a big step down in quality to this. Definitely. But, but ergonomically- Functionality wise- I and kind of prefer it to be honest, the okay. for my hands at least. Yeah. I love that. So yeah. yeah. So, I mean, look, there are a lot of options there and you do also have to factor in as well that personally I prefer the Fnatic ecosystem. I mean, the yeah. software is obviously a lot more refined yeah. than it is with SimMagic. Yeah, and jumping I mean, into different titles. And things jumping like into that. different it's titles, just... switching between profiles, updating firmware is a lot easier now as well with the latest update. Yeah. They've got yeah. that firmware manager yeah. software, which yeah. we need to take a look at actually yeah. on the channel. So yeah, look, I mean, overall Fnatic does have the upper hand when it comes to two things. I think the ecosystem and just the overall detail and fidelity in the force feedback, but they do lose out on the overall smoothness yeah. compared to this. Yeah. So then we compare with this SimiCube 2 Sport, which comes in at 2,200 Australian dollars. So a little bit more expensive, 17 Newton meters, but I think the difference between 17 and 15 is negligible. I don't think anybody's really gonna notice that. Uh, that doesn't have its own branded wheels. SimiCube don't sell their own wheels just yet. So we are limited to aftermarket wheels only. So that kind of makes things a little bit more tricky to compare there. Um, yeah. When we did the VRS Direct Force Pro review a couple of weeks ago, we actually asked the community what would be some of your recommendations mm. for wheels. And there was a whole bunch yeah, of really good suggestions really good. Yeah. throughout a large range of price points. So I'd recommend go watch that review yeah, yeah. and uh, we'll check, out, comments, yeah. check out the comments there because there's a bunch of suggestions there. But I mean, you know, if you were to pair a SC2 Sport with say an Asher Racing F28 SC or a Cube Controls um, Formula Pro or something like that, it is gonna be a lot yeah, more expensive. Yeah, yeah. And that is probably the closest you're gonna get quality wise to what yeah. these are. They are better quality than these, I think, but they're you know relatively close and it yeah, is gonna yeah. be quite a lot more expensive. The main differences I felt between the SC2 Sport and this is just in that finer refined detail. I think overall the smoothness and you know the, the feeling of weight transfer and traction loss is very, very, very close with this. The only difference there would be just, I think the slew rate is slightly lower on this motor, right. so it doesn't snap quite as quickly. It's right. not quite yeah. so responsive, but it is very, very close. And I think you would struggle to feel the difference there in a blind test, but where it does feel quite significantly different is just in that finer yeah. detail that we we're talking about mm. before. So. Look, in its own right, for me at least, I think it's a very good wheelbase. Hardware-wise, I think it's great. I think they do have some, some way to go in terms of the software and firmware side of things. But, I mean, yeah, look, when you compare it to other options that are on the market, it does become a little bit more of a difficult sell. I think if you can find one of these for a similar price to a VRS Direct Force Pro, then it is definitely worth trying to get your hands on both and testing them for yourselves. I think, you know, the Direct Force Pro wins out slightly on the feeling of the force feedback, just in that finer yeah, detail exactly, once yeah. again, but the overall smoothness and refinement is very, very similar. Obviously this has the advantage of the quick release, the ecosystem with the wheels yep. and everything like that. It is a more compact, more refined and cleaner package as oh, well. It integrates so nicely into your, your yeah, rig and everything. It does integrate it's very really nicely. Nice. Getting your monitor right up to the back here without plugs in the way, those kind of things. It's really yeah, nice. Yeah, so it, it is a really nice product. And I mean, you can see where, you know, where the money is in it. it it's certainly not a cheap feeling product at no. all. I mean, no. it's, it's very high quality, so no problems at all there. 
Um, and you might just really love these rims and want these rims, in which case it's a great option all around. Yeah, I mean, you can <laughs> use these rims plugged in via USB as well, yeah. but I think really where the value for money is is, is in how the, it integrates. Is how it integrates yeah. through the Bluetooth yeah. connection, and that does work very yeah. well. We didn't have any problems with dropouts or anything like that at yeah, all. True. So, yeah, I mean, compared to the VRS Direct Force Pro, I think it is a tough one. I think there are pros and cons in both camps, but when it comes down to the raw quality of the force feedback, I do think the VRS does have the slight upper hand. You do have to consider the price difference there as well, depending again on where you live. So compared with the Fnatic DD1, this does come in at $100 more expensive and five Newton meters less dynamic range, so to speak. Again, I don't think most people are gonna feel the difference in overall strength, I think that most people are gonna probably end up around that sort of 10 Newton meter mark anyway. Yep. So I don't think that's really a selling point. I wouldn't choose the DD1 over this purely because it has that extra five yep. Newton meters. Again, where it comes down to for me is just the value that you place in that ecosystem. You have more of an abundance of choice when it comes to ecosystem friendly rims with the Fnatic as well. And it does have that little bit more detail, but you do have that underpinning graininess and yep. notchy kind of effect. For me, I would on. go the detail in those road textures over the smoothness. Okay, yes. some people, may not they agree might, with that yeah, some people absolutely. may prefer the smoothness but yep. for me it is it is close yeah but i think for me i i, I value that ecosystem and yeah, also the yeah. fact that you know the fanatic one just works with every single sim you just yep. plug it in it just goes you don't have to stuff around with many adjustments you yeah. know they're very it's very uniform between different sim titles as well and that's something that we've harped on about in a lot of our wheelbase reviews mm -hmm. you know if you're a person that jumps in and out of different sims all the time and wants a pretty consistent experience between them then fanatic I think it does better than anybody does really else well, does in yeah. that space. Yeah. The VRS wasn't as good in that regard. Yeah. Simicube isn't as good in that regard either, yeah. although they are getting closer. Yeah. But yeah, I think that, you know, if those are the things that are important to you, then the Fnatic is probably the better choice there. And then we look at the Simicube 2 Sport at 2,200. That is quite a big step up when you look at the cost of rims that kind of provide the same quality as this as well that are compatible. You could use these rims on the Simicube, and I have actually done that with the GT1 rim before connected via USB. With the Sim Magic, you do have the advantage of the fully powered wireless quick release system, which you don't get with the Simicube. You have to rely on rechargeable or replaceable batteries. Yep, That's yep. never really been a problem for me. You just kind of recharge the wheel once every couple of weeks or yeah, okay. you know replace the battery once every few yep. years and it's fine. But you know I think that, that that is something that does bother some people and I do, when, I, when I'm being completely honest, prefer the fact that this is completely powered and wireless. You just plug it in and it just goes. Yep. I think that that is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. So that is one thing to consider there. But I think overall, you know, for the money, the Simicube 2 Sport does provide the better overall driving experience. So I guess ultimately for me, what it boils down to is I don't have any reason not to recommend the Simagic Alpha. I think it's a really great wheelbase and, you know, really nice quality hardware wise, no real problems at all to speak of. I just think that there are some other options out there that are perhaps slightly better value for money that provide a slightly better ecosystem or a slightly better driving experience. And it's really going to boil down to what's most important to you and what kind of value you can get where you live as well. But I do think that it's important once again to just highlight for you guys that might have skipped to the end of this video that all the problems that we had, and when I say all the problems, we didn't have that many problems, but all the little concerns that we had with it were all things that were around the software side yeah. of things. I think the hardware itself is really fantastic. And I think if they can really nail those little things in the software down, fix up the firmware upgrading process, and uh, maybe add a couple of those missing filters that we missed from the Simicube side, particularly the static force yeah. reduction filter, that was something that we nitpicked in the VRS Direct Force Pro yeah. review as well. And I think that, you know, both of these wheelbases, this and the Direct Force Pro would be a whole lot better if they did have that static mm. force reduction filter, because that would mean you could bring up those other details a little bit more without sort of being overloaded with the cornering forces. Yeah, yeah. So, so that seems to be the kind of thing that they might be adding in the near future. Well, I mean, I don't imagine, know, I don't yeah. know, but I mean, what, I guess the point here is that it's a software it thing. It could be done. So there's yes. no reason why if you were to purchase one of these today, you couldn't have a way better driving experience you know, further down the track. And it's also important to remember how bad the Fnatic DD1 and DD2 were when they were first released. Oh, really? They were horrible. <laughs> oh, I mean, when I first plugged in my DD2. What is this? I hated it. Oh, wow. I didn't like it as much as my Club Sport wheelbase 2.5. It wasn't until I updated yeah, right. to the more recent firmware. And yeah, I, okay. I talked about this in the review. Yeah, yeah. When I put the new firmware on it, it was a completely different yeah, experience. Wow. And there's no reason why the same thing can't happen with this as well. Yeah, okay. So I think it's very important to call but that we out. we also can't promise that. We can't promise it, no. <laughs> But there's no reason to believe that it yeah. can't be done. That's the point. Yeah. So this isn't a bad buy. It's just right at this very point in time, 
I believe that there are better options with better driving experiences yeah, for yeah. similar or slightly cheaper. That so sense, yep. that's what you need to consider. Yep. So that's what it boils down to for me, guys. Hopefully you found the review <laughs> interesting and useful. If you have, as always, hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing as well so you don't miss future videos. Big thank you once again to simrigs.com as well for sending this gear out to us to review. You can check them out in the description link down below as well. Thank you guys very much for watching and we'll see you again soon. See ya. Bye.